Hello, everybody. Um, great to see many of you have stayed from the launch of the Rocks That Shape Australia display and have hung about to hear the talk. I think a few different people have come in, but um, I guess I'd really just like to stand on the shoulders of uh, that marvellous welcome to country that we had from Tyrone Bell. And, um, but I will further acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the, um, of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. Um, but who have had a long connection to this beautiful, incredible Canberra landscape um, and have lived there in the past, continue to live here and do so into the future and, and share this place with all of us. Um, magnificent. Um, but I'd also like to single out those that have come from outside of Geoscience Australia, as well as saying thanks to those from Geoscience Australia that have come to the seminar, but those that have come from outside. And if this is your first time at Geoscience Australia, I hope you find it interesting and find lots of really good things to look at. For those that are here again, um, yeah, I hope you have a great visit. Um, a little bit of background. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm not Marita Bradshaw. I, I probably think that many more times than I would ever um, <laughs> normally confess, but um, I wish I was Marita Bradshaw, but I'm not. Um, but, um, but it's great. To... <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so Marita hasn't been all that well lately and was unable to, um, to do the talk, but it's great that she's here um, and, and in support of it. And you can see that I'm definitely acknowledging Marita. However, um, please, if there's anything that you don't like about the talk, blame me, not Marita. Um, and, trying to keep us really contemporary, I'll call this the Steve Ogeo remix of um, Marita's work. So, um, but as I said, I feel a bit uh, embarrassed to actually give an acknowledgement of country, um, given Tyrone's excellent welcome earlier, but um, yeah. Okay, so let's get into it. Our country and the rocks it's made of tell stories that really have shaped our nation. I think many of us here like to think the rocks speak to us, like this one here saying hi. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yes, um, I know I'm, I don't normally publicly confess that I think the rocks speak to us, um, but apparently it's all okay to speak to the rocks. But um, they certainly have their stories that they tell, whether they speak or don't speak. And of course, um, let's not, let's just assume they don't literally speak in this way. But rather than speaking, it's what they tell us through their science and then how they interact with the environment, including our society and culture. And I've got some examples of just that connection to landscape. In this case, it's from the Geoscience Australia graduate trip that just finished last week, where we went over to Western Australia. And really the big theme of that trip was to engage across that broad definition of geoscience that we have at Geoscience Australia that extends just you know, well beyond geology into so many other areas. But here are some examples of the graduates actually connecting, understanding, and really appreciating the, the significance and wonderful stories of, of these different rocks, uh, in this case around Yarragadee and, and between Yarragadee and Perth in Western Australia. But you don't even have to go that far. Um, could be looking at rocks in Central Australia. This is one that I think everyone, when they talk about the significant rocks and rocks that tell a story, I think this one, which needs no introduction, so I won't, um, comes to mind. But as I said, um, even pulling it in even more locally to our wonderful Canberra district and the influence of the rocks the geology, the landscape on our society and, and how we live here is quite profound. In fact, you look at the, um, the Burley Griffins and their design of Canberra and how much it focused around particularly the different hillsides, the rivers, the valleys, which all relate to different rocks and their properties. Um, and only have to look at things like Parliament House where uh, Verity Normington and myself were running tours over the weekend for National Science Week and the unconformity that sits under that building and what that really means for the local geology but how it's important footings for that building as well. Our democracy in that case quite literally stands on these ancient rocks. 
So let's, let's have a bit of a focus, probably a big difference in what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna focus a bit more on the display and how that evolved. Marita tends to get straight into the, 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 the seven rocks or more that, that made Australia. Um, I'll give a little bit more background though on that fantastic display that we had launched this morning. And really the reason that came about was out of that acknowledgement that at Geoscience Australia, we have amazing stories about the science and the impact of our work. And it's a challenge not only for us, but I think for all geoscientists as well as scientists about how we can best engage those stories with people, the public, and about the value of it and really to make it so that it's understandable and really shares the passion that we all have for our work. And we were, we were really, um, we were struggling with that challenge as well at Geoscience Australia. And one of the big questions is how can our foyer public space best tell some of those stories? We've got this incredible space, lots of people come through it. And, you know, we thought, I think when I first came to Geoscience Australia, there was the idea of perhaps we could try and develop some sort of Geoscience Hall of Fame. Um, but then exploring for the future, the second round there came up and there was an opening and a recognition by exploring for the future, which I really appreciate, that there was a, there was a need to not just do great science, but to make sure that that was socialised and that knowledge, if you like, was shared with Australians because that's who we're doing the work for. And so um, we started to look to develop a proposal called Stories in Stone, really recognising the story side of what we do. And then at about, about the same time, maybe just a little earlier, Marita started touring a fantastic talk called The Seven Rocks That Made Australia. And it was almost like the way that Marita had hit on to that value of the kind of like the countdown, the top 10 or top seven list, um, which is used by so many other um, parts of our society, the seven wonders of the world, the seven habits of highly effective people, the history of the world in, in 100 objects. She really picked something there that I thought was really exciting. Um, and really what happened then is you start to bring all of those threads together and that's what's brought us to the rocks that shape Australia. We've been quite deliberate in the naming of it, that it's actually um, present, future tense, not shaped. We, we thought about that quite hard and that we thought an important part of it was not just to recognise the amazing stories that have happened or the history, but to also recognise how important these rocks are into the future, either as new rocks that we want to put forward, but even the old rocks that had had stories in the past continue to have stories into the future as well. So there was a big part of that in the naming of that display. The other challenge we had was how do you choose the rocks to highlight as being nationally significant? That was a big thing that we wanted to really get across. Um, and to start with, we did use Marita's seven to begin with. And that was, um, you know, that was really valuable to be able to do that. But we also, I know Alice and Steve and their teams did a lot of consultation around, um, I know they spent quite a bit of time at Questacon actually doing a lot of public consultation about what rocks, what stories really made a difference to the public there and got some great feedback um, on that. And, and, and I think it did contribute a lot to how we took things forward. And as, I, as I, I, I don't tire of this because I think it's just such a wonderful internal Geoscience Australia example, but that partnership with Exploring for the Future and Geoscience Australia's discovery engagement team, particularly um, the collections team and the client and visitor services teams um, has been really value and then, valuable. And then as we've then moved on, how that's then expanded and involved the team from um, the comms group and, and just different parts of Geoscience Australia coming together on this. And I think that's the sort of thing that makes it work. And then that more recent endorsement to have Minister King see some of the promotions on, I think it was on Facebook where she saw it, where we we're looking to name the Ichiosaur and she um, just thought, this is fantastic. I've got to come out and see it. And she. She came out for an informal visit pretty much in her own time to, to have a look at this and, and, and see how it, 
how it was all coming together. And I think that's fantastic and just what we were aiming for. Before I go on, I, I'm going to embarrass you one, probably one last time, Marita. No, probably not. But, but I just want to, I do want to particularly acknowledge Marita. And this is one advantage of me giving the talk and not Marita, because I can go to town on this if she's too modest to do that. But just that background for those that don't know a lot of Marita's background. She's, she was a geologist for Geoscience Australia for over 30 years. Um, and I think the really exciting thing in Marita's story, or one of the really exciting things, is that she's really shown over that 30 years that adaptive evolution of a scientist where there has been a lot of focus, particularly on oil and gas and, and the paleogeography of Australia that goes with that. But then more recently, um, looking at the needs for knowledge around um, hydrogen and particularly hydrogen storage. Um, the other thing that, that Marita's brought to this has been her passion for science communication. And I think when you combine a great scientific mind, the ability to change and adapt to the needs of that science um, with that passion for communicating and listening and engaging, I think you've got a really good mix there. So um, I think that's a, a great part of it. For us, it meant that this display could stand on the shoulders of the giant. And Marita had already done a lot of the road testing. If, if any of the um, seven were, were, were no good, she would have been told and we would have heard about it. And so it gave us a lot of confidence too, Marita. So thanks for that. Um, and, you know, I, I think the other thing about acknowledging Marita in this for all of us is I think it says something about who we are as either Geoscience Australia or even that wider geoscience community. And it's great to celebrate and acknowledge someone who has been a, a great part of that and continues to be a good, I shouldn't talk in, but you're still shaping, so yeah. So yeah, good on you, Marita. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is really just say a little bit about each of the eight that we've got in there, and then we'll open up perhaps for a little bit more passionate discussion at the end about what needs to come next, and we'll open that up and, and love to hear what, what everyone thinks here. But I'm assuming that many of you have had the chance to have a bit of a look at the display and, and perhaps even read some of the things that are there. There might be a few of you that haven't really looked yet. So for those that haven't looked yet, this might be a really good primer and lead in. For those that have looked, this might hopefully just add a little more, might make you go back and look again and, and think a bit more about it. But the number one rock that we've got there, um, and, the, and it, the numbers are not based on any sort of merit, they're based on the numbers that we've just given them for convenience to help, to help work your way through. Um, is really that the Pilbara banded iron formation. Um, and there's, there's some details there about where that specimen's from. Um, but one of the great things about this exhibit is the way that we've looked to combine not only the rocks, but some other display item that really draws attention to a feature of the rock. And I love the way in this case, um, we have this air cylinder that was donated from the Marimbula Diving Lodge. And um, it's great, Alice is nodding there because she did a lot of that, or her team did a lot of the work in securing these samples. So just reassures me that I'm, I, I do listen. <laughs> um, but, but, that, but that cylinder really signifies the importance of this time in our geological evolution towards having photosynthetic um, living organisms that, um, that produced oxygen and ch change the fundamental chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere at that time. And in fact, you can all take a deep breath with confidence and joy today because of this. So, um, but not only is it about the, um, about the oxygenation, but then there was this critical side effect that came from that. And that is that all of a sudden iron became oxidized. And then iron's oxidized, it becomes quite stable in the, in the environment. And that was what we started to see uh, at this time and associated with these rocks. And in fact, the mining of these banded iron formations in the Pilbara and perhaps a little bit of um, surface enrichment through more recent weathering has really led to that concentration of iron oxide that has created one of Australia, or has created Australia's greatest export earner. Really important industry for this nation. And we really enjoy the prosperity and lifestyle that we do because of this. And so um, a fascinating story about the evolution of the earth, but an equally important one for our lives. 
Oh, I should just point out, if you do go to Perth, this is an excellent piece of banded iron formation um, and, a, and a great display there that I think really adds to, to what we're, we've got in our um, foyer display as well. The second rock there, Broken Hill Ore. This is, I will confess, this is my, probably got a bit of a personal thing here. I did do my PhD out at Broken Hill and I, I just love the, I love the region, not just because of the, the geology and the landscape, but because of the stories that, that go with that. And I think that's the really strong part of the Broken Hill story is not only was it the world's largest silver lead zinc ore body when it was discovered in 1883, but then the whole cultural and, and social story and community that developed out of that discovery, both for Broken Hill, but for the rest of Australia. And now even internationally, when you look at companies like Broken Hill Proprietary Limited that started out at Broken Hill. It's a little bit of a snapshot of it. Great story of discovery by Charles Rasp, who was a boundary rider, who was riding, supposed to have been riding a horse along the boundary, fell off his horse by, by you know, legend dictates, um, and, he, and he was apparently fairly short-tempered and in his anger banged at the rocks and then um, thought, hello, this is a bit different, and actually thought that the um, Broken Hill ore body, that uh, the part of it that he came across was actually an enrichment in uh, tin oxide or cassiterite. And so he sent it off for analysis only to find that the particular bit that he'd sampled was, was particularly silver rich um, with some lead and zinc, but mostly silver rich. And that's, that then led to the discovery. I think it's a really interesting story also because um, we think about how we use science for our discoveries and, and or to lead discovery. Um, and yet there was an era in time where a lot of these things did literally stick out of the ground and they were found by um, prospectors, boundary riders, rabbit shooters and things like that. I don't think, no, I am confident that that approach is not going to work and continue today because most of the, or pretty much all of the surface exposures have been looked at around Australia um, and that's why Geoscience Australia and, and, and programs like Exploring for the Future really need to lead with science and technology for looking for more or better concealed mineral discoveries. Just onto the culture of that this led to at Broken Hill. I mean, firstly, it led to people forming a city in a arid, fairly arid part of Australia, which is, there has to be something pretty special out there to make people do that. Um, but then when we see the um, development, not only of of amazing corporate entities like BHP, but also the um, culture of workers' rights and, and unionism um, and so forth that was developed um, really out of the Broken Hill Mines. And I've got there the, a photo of, a, of basically an effigy grave for a labourer who dared to breach the picket line in the, um, in the, um, in the 1909 strikes that went for 18 months which is an incredible bit of um, industrial um, conflict. Um, but yeah, they were quite passionate and quite vocal in how they um, really held the ranks together. Um, the, the other thing that's exciting about Broken Hill, of course, is that that culture and that, that real societal influence is something that is held on to dearly and cherished in the, in the modern day community. And we can see here a photo of the Junction Mine in 1901 um, and then here we have a photo that, a um, very recent photo of the same mine. And walking through the exposures of the Broken Hill line of load at that mine, which is quite exciting, it's a public space, but also through the old equipment and shafts is really eerie. It's quite an eerie feeling and quite something to, to sort of reflect on and contemplate. Um, and, and the Bro city of Broken Hill is extremely proud of being a place where you can do that and learn a lot about where we've been. But it's not just about where we've been. Broken Hill, I think, is a great example of, it's also how we look forward and, and look to the future. And one of the big challenges for Broken Hill has been that although it's an enormous deposit, they've really been, there's been no others found at, at anywhere near that size in the entire district. And that, that's 
an incredible thought because we all tend to work on the premise that if we, someone has some luck finding something somewhere, then we need to go and have a good look because, in that area because there must be another one around. Broken Hill hasn't provided that for silver lead zinc, um, although it is exciting that um, recent cobalt discoveries and, and a lot of the critical minerals that we're now looking at for that energy transition are a critical part of the future exploration in that Broken Hill district. But one of the big reasons why discovery has been so challenging is if you see on your left there, that photo of the Mundy Mundy Plains, so much of these prospective rocks are covered by the regolith. And um, how we understand that regolith and can explore through it, using all sorts of different, or through it and within it, uh, is really critical. And, and I highlight there some of um, the ETF work that Carol was a big part of um, around looking at that um, lithospheric and, and lithospheric architecture and tells us about when we put those geophysical results together, how that can start to give us some really important and valuable insights into how perhaps the mineralisation has formed and where we can perhaps predict further discoveries. And Broken Hill, funny little outlier here, um, is, is certainly fitting into a lot of that, that great research that Exploring for the Future has done. The third, the third image I've got here I just want to highlight seems like a sort of black stick in the ground. It's actually quite a large sculpture in the centre of Broken Hill and it was done by Pro Hart. And I remember visiting Pro Hart's gallery when he was making this in the mid 90s. And I love the way he talks about how the masks on that sculpture are in clusters of three. And the three masks represent the, the contemporary people of Broken Hill and the different masks they have for work, home and community. And how the complexity of that how it comes together and how that really is a key to understanding and taking Broken Hill forward into the future. Okay, number three, the gold bearing meta sediments of Victoria. Fantastic specimen that was donated to us from the um, Victorian government. Um, but I love the, um, the, the thought that's gone behind the, um, the, the pick and the coins. Um, they symbolise very strongly the importance that this rock and the, and the Victorian gold, gold rush in particular had on um, migration or immigration to Australia and was really that onset of multiculturalism for our country. So once again, the rocks have led to a lot of where we're at today in our society. Fantastic effort with the, um, with the, the pick. And the coins, I think, coins are uh, over, some of them are about 900 years old that we've, we've had looked at there, um, that we've had donated to us from different museums in, um, mostly in Victoria, I think, and, and collections there. Um, but just to highlight, um, you know, to, to see things like mining, in this case, a fairly modern expression of that, that's actually the mine where that sample comes from that we have in the display, and how that then links into the, the development and, of, and prosperity that we see particularly in those old buildings in Victoria, such as, in this case, the exhibition building. It also, I mentioned that, that social impact with the um, immigration and migration influences there, and we can see the, um, a, a sketch there from the Sovereign Hill Museum of the Chinese mining influence. Incredible to think that associated with these rocks that between 1851 and 1871, Australia's population quadrupled from 430,000 to 1.7 million people. Timing was fortuitous because it largely came after the um, gold rushes in the US. So a lot of people who didn't do so well there were pretty keen to try somewhere else and came to Australia. Um, but it also contributed to a lot of um, the social fabric of, of um, working workers unionism, and probably no stronger example of that than the Eureka Stockade. I apologise that I don't have a beautiful flag, Eureka flag that's unfurled there. I, I stood there for near an hour waiting for the wind to pull the flag out. That was as good as it got, um, which is unusual for Ballarat. Um, and then identities such as um, Peter Layla, um, who led, was seen by many to lead that Eureka rebellion, um, who then became celebrated and became honourable after, after that time, um, which is 
I think, a really big statement about how these things not only were an uprising or um, a, a big part of our, our uh, social fabric, but they actually became the norm or part of the accepted part of our Australian society. Number four, the Permian coal. I know that there's a lot of stigma around coal at the moment, but I think firstly we have to acknowledge that it has been a big part, um, a big export earner and a big part of our development of a nation. But it's also important to recognise that the coal that we see is used for a whole lot of other uses besides just um, energy. It's, it's important in steel manufacture um, and also the trace element compositions of coals are getting quite a bit of attention at the moment. One of the things that's also exciting about this coal is that it tells us a lot about the paleo environment of Australia going back into the Permian times. Um, and we see here these glossopterous, uh, fairly primitive swampy type forests that, that led to that accumulation of coal. Australia at that time was, was located um, a lot further south than it is today or, or near the South Pole. Um, so we have these um, high latitude forests and build up or, of organic material. And particularly what we're highlighting here are those Eastern Australian Permian coal basins and how important that they've been. The fifth one, water. Australia is the driest inhabited continent on earth. And so water is a particularly valuable resource and particularly in our arid, semi-arid interior. And what a difference it's made to have the Great Artesian Basin extend through that area. And um, our fifth rock there, uh, the Jurassic Precipice Sandstone sample recognises that. And I just think this is the a, a, a really engaging piece of um, First Nations art here by um, Jeanette Long Nakamura uh, that really shows her portrayal of under, underground water and springs. Um, just absolutely stunning painting. It's great to see that actually stand right in front of it. But of course, these rocks holding those aquifers, carrying discharge, and in many cases, many millions of years old, into the centre of Australia or inland areas of Australia um, is, is, has been absolutely fundamental for our development. And we can see that where, where would we be without that water extraction, either through water bores with this windmill, or in this case, we have the, the mound spring deposits, which were used by First Nations peoples for many, many thousands of years and important parts of the ecosystems in those areas. It's just all that talk about water. It's made me need to have a drink. Okay, here's one that's spectacular. There we see Marita hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Been dying to say that. <clears throat> and that is the Cretaceous marine sediments. These are very closely associated with some of the great artesian basin uh, rocks that I pointed out in the last rock there. Um, but what we're really pointing out here has been that influence of an inland sea in the Cretaceous that extended into large parts of inland Australia, or what are now inland Australia. And we see um, also some quite remarkable landscapes. In some, in some cases, we see these spectacular breakaways. These are near Coobapiti. For those that have seen Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, would be quite familiar with these. And then for many areas, we see these vast flat plains. This is the Moon Plain near Coobapiti on the right there. It's also really interesting thinking about these landscapes and what they mean. Um, from the perspective of the explorer Charles Sturt. Charles Sturt was obsessed with finding an inland sea in Australia. And I know it's easy in hindsight to think he may, well, some people might think that he's a bit of a duffer for thinking that he could go and do that. But the incredible thing about Sturt was that at the time of, of that expedition, large inland seas and waterways were being found in many other continents that did a lot to open those continents up. But also, the incredible thing about Sturt when you read his journals is to see how, how astute he was in reading the landscape. And it just turned out that he was 100 or so million years too late. But the irony here is that many of Australia's landscape features are, of course, very ancient. And so a lot of what he was reading in the landscape actually was indeed landscape features that were relating to an inland sea. Um, and here we see 
I mean, we see some of the celebration of Sturt, although he probably, I think, should feel a little bit hard done by. He probably didn't quite get the kudos that he deserved. Um, and here we see the large can of silkrete that's made up of a mixture mostly of Cretaceous marine sediments, but with some tertiary in there as well. And he did this as his, as his exploration team was caught up in a drought in that part of northwestern New South Wales near Tibberborough, near Milparinka. And unfortunately, at that, that very time, his second in command, James Poole, passed away. And to keep morale, to keep engagement, and to keep fitness in the group, he had his men build this can on top of this mountain near their camp there. But it's a phenomenal place. If you haven't been to what's known as Depot Glen near Milparinka, um, incredible to think about what went on there. But really a lot of that work of Sturt and those early exp explorers goes back to the Cretaceous marine sediments that we are celebrating here. The other part of it, of course, we've mentioned that this time is associated with uh, dinosaurs or marine reptiles, which are not technically dinosaurs because they don't stand upright. They don't have that hole in their hip bones that, um, that enables dinosaurs to stand upright, whereas these things um, were swimming around. Um, we have marita hanging from our ceiling, but also we have um, plesiosaurs, uh, and this is a great example from Andamuka that's on public display of an opalized plesiosaur, and this was actually quite a young um, plesiosaur. And it was felt that that part of the inland sea, that southern part, was an important carving ground within the inland sea at that time. And we see quite a few um, juvenile remains of plesiosaurs around that Andamuka area and, and across to White Cliffs as well. One of the most important host materials for forming opal are actually these marine sediments and how they fit into the weathering of those marine sediments in subsequent landscapes is, a, is an absolutely fascinating story about how those sediments have prevailed. Okay, number seven is the um, fantastic southern, I've, I've added a bit in here, um, I think the sign outside says Cenozoic limestone, which is great, um, but in particular that southern continental margin, Cenozoic limestones. The one that we've got out in the, in the foyer is from Batesford near Geelong. Um, and what this really shows that's incredible is Australia's separation and isolation and northward drift um, during the Cenozoic. And that then contributed to things like the biogeographic isolation with our friend here, the swamp wallaby. Okay. Um, and, and this is just some of, that, some of that background behind it. We can see to the south of Australia, um, we were once joined to Antarctica, and during the Cenozoic, we had that seafloor spreading and very rapid northward movement, which continues today. Australia <coughs> continues to move at about seven centimetres a year northwards into, into Southeast Asia. Um, and, and it's really because of that that Australia became girt by sea. We had the development of the circumpolar current and these very fertile waters leading to the deposition of um, marine limestones along much of that southern margin, which including places like in South Australia, this is an example from Port Wollonga, south of Adelaide, the brilliant Nullarbor Plain, which I forgot to put a photo in, I fully intended to, but um, I know I missed out on that one, um, being really notable landscape features associated with that. And the last one, and I know that we've got a few people in the audience that are keen to to see this one celebrated, and it's an absolutely fantastic one. And this is the, um, some of the um, scoria or, or basaltic lava from Budge Bin, near, which is also known as Mount Eccles uh, in Victoria, and this beautiful woven um, eel trap. Thank you, Sandra, that's just absolutely stunning feature. Just wanna say a little bit about these. Really important because they really signify that for thousands of years, we've been living with this landscape. And in this case, we've had a very sophisticated aquaculture system and settlement um, associated with these um, eel traps, fish traps, if you like, uh, in this area. Um, we have the incredible um, volcanic province, the Western Victoria Volcanic Plains, and here we can see the scoria cone of Mount Elephant on the left, but closer to Budge Bin, the, um, 
the, the uh, scoria quarry that um, taps into some of these um, volcanic deposits, if you like, that were in some places um, quite vesicular lavas. And it was these vesicular lavas that were um, constructed and built and put together to form walls, generally up to about a metre, and also um, opening up trenches. You can see this, this quite old mapping from the Victorian Archaeological Survey showing in plan some of these um, effectively aquaculture systems. And I came upon these excellent note or really interesting notes from G.A. Robinson in 1841. And um, a little hard to read it all, a bit scribbly, but I love the way you can see these eel traps here, very similar to the ones that Sandra's um, put together and, and um, we have out in the foyer. The other thing that comes through here, is you might see this sort of needle looking thing at the top, you can see here, and you can see the eels basically being held by that pointy stick or needle um, after they've caught them in the trap. Actually, I was told earlier that the eels don't swim backwards, and that's one of the real key things to how these um, traps work. And apparently some of the eels, they, they grow a metre, typically about a metre long, and are the um, diameter of your forearm. So these things would have been a pretty good feed. So those, um, those sticks that they impaled through the eels would, would have been doing quite a bit of work to hold them all together. So there's the eight that we've got out there already, but we all know that there's a lot more to this nation than just eight rocks. And one of the things that I want to put to all of you is to think about what next? What are we missing? What are the other rocks that tell the stories of our nation and have shaped and shape our nation. Some of the ways that we're looking to collect that information is not just through talking to people, but we have a board out there where people are writing down suggestions. Some of the suggestions are fantastic. We've had a really big push for diamonds, a lot of people suggesting Uluru. Um, a lot of actually one thing one thing that's come out quite consistently is beach sand, both um, contemporary and ancient. Um, a lot of people have also want Dwayne Rock Johnson to yeah. appear in a, in a glass case out there. Um, but some of the other things that have been coming up in discussions are the um, lithium-rich pegmatites, really important for our future, particularly with batteries and, and um, you know, recognition of critical minerals. Anthropocene, or um, rocks that humans have been able to form also a really important thing to recognise. Um, and one suggestion has been around mine site tailings, trying to find some that are quite stable and able to be put forward there. And of course, Exploring for the Future is working a lot on um, those sorts of materials. You heard Tyrone Bell talk earlier about how he's got some rocks that he's really keen to share with us. And um, I've seen some of his rocks, they're absolutely fantastic. A lot of them are Ordovician cherts uh, that tell great stories and of great significance, particularly to the local Ngunnawal people. But it would be great to hear your suggestions and thoughts. I think there's some really good ideas brewing out there, um, and it'd be great to see those stories come forward. I think the other thing to recognise about the future is, of course, recognising that our science also evolves and changes. And we see that even in exploring for the future and how we look to how that can remain current, and relevant and important to our nation. And that, of course, brings up different materials every time that happens. I think there's also scope for other aspects of Geoscience Australia's work that can be re represented in our public spaces. I think this is a, um, I think there's an opportunity here to recognise what partnership and support can achieve. Um, but perhaps there's some other areas, things like what about the maps that shape Australia? Um, and we currently have plans for upgrading, particularly down our, what we call the streets, those side corridors, and particularly the one out this side of the building, which goes past our National Earthquake Alert Centre. And if you're visiting Geoscience Australia and you haven't walked down there and seen that, that's where really a lot of the, um, the science happens around um, recording and reporting on the earthquakes that you hear about. And it's well worth walking, walking down uh, just a little way just to see some of those uh, to see that space and some of the work that we're doing there. So I'd like to wrap up 
and say that um, thanks for your interest today. Thanks for coming along. And um, just to, to remind everyone about how important our rocks have been in contributing to our identity, both in the past, present, well, not just both, in the past, present, and into the future. And um, really, Geoscience Australia's work, especially through Exploring for the Future, has focused on using our knowledge of our continent and the rocks to shape our evolving nation and our lives. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.